right uh, so good evening everyone just let me know in the chat box if my audio and video is uh, good so i'm just waiting for your comments <clears throat> Right. So we'll start. Uh, so Venkateshwaran. Uh, uh, right. Okay. <clears throat> right. Okay. So I'm just starting in thirty seconds. Okay, right. So let's start uh, today's uh, clinical case challenge. So today's clinical case challenge is based on an actual case scenario of a patient who had come to me. And um, I want all my listeners to actively participate in the discussion. So, you know, when I show you the slides, at some point of time, if you want to say, this is probably what I think is the diagnosis. You're free to answer in the uh, comment section or the chat box. So I'll be waiting for your uh, answers as well. So just feel free to answer what you think, okay? So have no inhibitions. This is just a scenario. And uh, after this scenario about the topic, um, all important points, I'm not going to go vast into the topic. This will be a a concise discussion, but whatever is required from an exam point of view, uh, based on the previous year questions that I'll be just quickly discussing. So let me quickly share the screen with uh, you guys now. Right, so let me know if uh, you're able to see the screen now. Okay, right. So let's start uh, with today's uh, clinical case challenge. Here is your clinical Thursday question for you. Right, so basically let me tell you, I'm just going to give you a case summary. I'm not going to go for an elaborate um, uh, case, uh, uh, you know, elaboration, just like you have in an exam. I'll be telling you the summary points only, just the key points so that you uh, pick up what points are most important and uh, you can come to conclusions. So the case summary is that of a 50-year-old male, okay? And uh, he presented to us with fever of one month duration, okay? It was a high-grade fever with chills and rigor with significant weight loss. Okay, got it? Fine. So some positive history there. Coming to some negative history, no history of any cough, 
no abdominal or urinary symptoms, no history of myalgia, arthralgia, no history of any recent travel outside, and no history of any contact with tuberculosis. Okay, right. So these are my uh, basic summary points. At this point of time, my dear students, do you want to comment uh, anything? It need not be the diagnosis per se, but something you want to tell me at this point, seeing the case summary, the positive and the short negative history. Just let me know in the chat box. I'll be waiting for your comments. Uh, and as I proceed to the examination, you can uh, type in. So I can see, uh, uh, so Sandhya says, uh, could possibly be a tuberculosis. Vaishnavi could be a lymphoma. And uh, there is a possibility of chronic myeloid leukemia. Uh, Sinduja meningitis. So I'm, I'm seeing any carcinoma. Okay, right. So Adila is thinking in lines of a differential diagnosis of a prolonged fever, right? Let's move forward to the examination. So examination, the patient is poorly built and nourished with a body mass index of 17.2. And I've just given a picture also of the patient, some finding that I'm just showing. Okay, so I'm just showing you some finding. Okay, I'm not going to tell you what it is. Okay, and uh, some more positive findings. Again, just the positive findings. I'm not going to the negative findings. Pallor was there. Bilateral pitting petal edema. The patient was febrile. Hepatomegaly, 6 cm below the right coastal margin in the midclavicular line. And there was a massive splenomegaly. And why do I say that? It's because the spleen is reaching up to the umbilicus. Okay, so yeah, what do you think right now? Okay, what do you think right now? Right now, what do you think? <laughs> Based on the examination findings. So I can see some chronic myeloid leukemia, Rohit uh, fever of unknown origin. So I can see so much of uh, CML, lymphoma, infective endocarditis. And let me tell you something, you know, I did not mention anything about cardiovascular system just because the cardiovascular system is normal. Okay. So, you know, I've just listed down the positive findings. That's it. No negative findings. If I've not mentioned regarding CVS, it just means CVS is normal. Okay. Right. So people are thinking more in lines of a myeloproliferative disorder. That is what I see. Arya, Aisha, Vaishnavi, Niyas, uh, so much of candidates going for CML. Good. Let's see. Now, uh, I'm going to go to the investigations. Again, investigations, I'm just going to focus on the positive investigations, okay? Positive investigations, right? So look at this. The hemoglobin is 7.8, MCV 74.3. The total count is 3,600. Platelet count is 90,000. ESR is 104. CRP is elevated. Urine routine, normal. The viral markers, HIV, HBSAG, anti-HCV and VDRL negative, ECG and chest X-ray normal, Manto test negative. The investigation slides are not over, but still based on this slide, do you have any comments? Based on this slide, do you have any comments? Based on this slide, do you have any comments? Any comments based on this slide? So I can see lymphoma. Sariga says infective endocarditis. Right. Myelofibrosis. Right. So basically, you know, what are the positive findings? We'll come to that. But let me just run through the other investigations as well. Peripheral smear showed microcytic hypochromic blood picture. The workup for malaria. So essentially the rapid malarial test was done. The peripheral smear for malarial parasite was negative. Typhoid negative, dengue negative, scrub typhus negative, brucellosis negative. Echocardiography, no vegetations, no, no, no vegetations. Blood culture and urine culture was sterile. No organism could be isolated. ANA negative, okay, so direct Coombs test and indirect Coombs test negative. Serum LDH normal. Uh, USD abdomen showed hepatosplenomegaly with normal liver echoes, okay, right. So I'm done with the basic set of investigations. And uh, let me just ask my dear students, what do you think after these two slides? Just uh, 
think about the history once again and look at the investigations and what do you think is uh, the probable diagnosis at this stage? Okay, things can change, but let me see if you can answer correctly. So I can see uh, uh, someone says uh, hemolytic anemia. Uh, but Seema, when you say hemolytic anemia, the peripheral smear should show evidence of hemolysis. Like there is no uh, schistocytes, so no evidence, no normoblasts, no evidence of uh, anything in the lines of uh, hemolysis. Thalassemia, well, uh, do you think thalassemia presents with a prolonged fever? I agree, you know, there is an anemia here, but does it pre present commonly with a prolonged fever? So Vaishnavi, it's unlikely to be a hemolytic anemia, right? Infectious mononucleosis, IMN, okay? Now, let me just tell you something here. You know, as a clinician, how I would think is, well, I would have had some differentials at the end of uh, history itself and in this, and examination. Uh, so, uh, but let me just tell you about investigations. So hemoglobin 7.8, TC 3,600, platelet count 90,000. How can I put it in one line? How can I put it in one line? Aisha Hana, any history of bone pain? No history of bone pain. Okay, so there is a pancytopenia. So it's very clear that there is a pancytopenia. There is a pancytopenia and the ESR is raised. Pancytopenia with raised ESR. Pancytopenia with raised ESR. Okay, okay. The CLCRP is elevated. So some sort of inflammation, infection, is evidenced by the CRP ESR elevation, but other investigations are normal. Okay, so it has some hematological implication. That is what I am thinking right now. There is some hematological implication, which is why there is a pancytopenia. So it might not be a direct hematological disease. It can even be an indirect one. But all other tests, so you can see that uh, most of the common infections have been ruled out. Peripheral smear, no malaria, echocardiography, no vegetations. Echocardiography is very important because in any prolonged fever, why do you do an echocardiography? It's to rule out infective endocarditis. Okay. So infective endocarditis, uh, blood culture also you would do, but no evidence. ANA and uh, direct combs test, indirect combs test, especially important in uh, the clinical suspicion of a connective tissue disease. Well, it's a 50-year-old male, so I'm not seriously suspecting a connective tissue disease because they are more common in females. So the ANA, yes, you can have connective tissue disease presenting with prolonged fever. That can happen. We have had cases of SLE pre presenting with prolonged fever, nothing else. Okay, serum LDH is normal. Now, I saw that some of my students were commenting about lymphoma in the differentials. It's a very good you know, differential, I agree, you know, it's a good differential, but just tell me something, what happens to the serum LDH in case of lymphomas? Just tell me what happens to the serum LDH in case of lymphomas. It will be elevated, but I'm not seeing an elevated LDH. I am seeing a normal LDH. Now, any prolonged fever, what is the importance of USG abdomen? Well, you've got a hepatosplenomegaly here, which is evident in the uh, clinical examination as well. But what is the importance of USG abdomen in a patient with a prolonged fever? Can anybody tell me? Okay. Can anybody tell me? So USG abdomen is very important in any prolonged fever to rule out abscess. Because sometimes we have had cases where some patients with an intra-abdominal abscess or you know, a pelvic abscess presenting with prolonged fever. There has not been any mention he is a diabetic or something because diabetes obviously predisposes to all these uh, abscesses. But again, USD abdomen is also not yielding. Okay. Now, at this point of time, um, for a clinician, okay, um, this is a fever of unknown origin. Now, why do I say this is a fever of unknown origin? Because as per the definition of fever of unknown origin, these are the four points given in Harrison, four important points. Number one, fever more than or equal to 38.3 degrees Celsius or more than or equal to 101 degree Fahrenheit on at least two occasions. Point number two, the illness duration should last for more than or equal to three weeks. 
no non immunocompromised state this patient is not a diabetic uh, is not having any evidence of tuberculosis his viral markers are negative so the hiv is also negative so there is no known immunocompromised state right and uh, there is a diagnosis that still remains uncertain after a thorough history taking physical examination and other obligatory lab investigation Harrison has given a list of obligatory lab investigations. That is some basic investigations like your blood routine, renal function test, liver function test, peripheral smear, the ANA, urine routine, the chest X-ray, the cultures, the echocardiography. So we have done that all. We have done the obligatory lab investigations and uh, we are nowhere. So now all of you, my dear students, do you agree that this is a fever of unknown origin? Yes or no? You agree that this is a fever of unknown origin? Yes. Now you tell me, where are we placed? What next? This is what I want to know from you. If you are the clinician at this point of time, what are you thinking about and what should be the next step? So Atira is saying the hemaheri cell leukemia is possible. So what should I do next? That's what uh, is the question. What should I do next? What's next? Okay, bone marrow, bone marrow. So I'm very, very happy. So my dear students, I can see a lot of students commenting about the next step should be a bone marrow. I completely agree with this. Now we have got um, a pyrexia of unknown origin and this has to be a bone marrow aspiration. So you've got to go for bone marrow. Why CT? You know, CT of what? Whole body CT, CT of brain. Where? CT of what? Okay, CT of the chest, CT of the abdomen. Obviously, yes, you're absolutely right. You've got to do a CT chest and CT abdomen as well. But in this case, the CT chest and CT abdomen was also done because sometimes, you know, chest X-ray can be normal. But only when you take a, a CT thorax, you might be able to find, a, you know, a fossae, maybe, you know, an evidence of tuberculosis. But as I said, workup for tuberculosis was negative. I already told in the history, I mean, in the investigation, which means the CT thorax and CT abdomen was done. It's normal. Okay. So I agree with most of you. This has to be a bone marrow aspirin. And yes, we went ahead with a bone marrow aspirin. And this was the aspirin report. Okay. So we went for a bone marrow study. And you know, when you, whenever you do a bone marrow study, you first do the bone marrow aspirin, where you do the aspirin. Then you take a piece of that bone and you send for the trifine biopsy, which is a more detailed study. The bone marrow aspirate is an aspirate which is prepared from the, you know, the aspirate material. You, you put it into a slide and you uh, see under the microscope and trifine, you know, you take that bone piece also, you send it to the pathology lab and you get a trifine biopsy. So anyway, the bone marrow aspirate was normal. Bone marrow aspirate was normal. And the trifine biopsy awaited, which means I've just said the aspirate is normal. I'm just waiting for the trifine biopsy. You might ask me, sir, why are you waiting for a biopsy? Because it takes some days for the biopsy result. Aspirate, you know, you can get it quickly uh, done by the pathologist. But biopsy, you know, they have got to undergo the procedure. So it takes a few days uh, to prepare the specimen and then, uh, you know, get it ready for examination. So the biopsy was awaited. So we, you know, since this case, we could not reach uh, uh, a definite diagnosis at this point. You know, we uh, had a close consultation with the pathology department and uh, the refined biopsy was awaited. Okay, now what? Now I tell you something interesting happened. During the hospital stay, this patient developed a new finding, okay? He told us, doctor, I am having a swelling in my fingers. And this is that swelling, okay? Doctor, I'm having a swelling in the fingers. So what did I ask him? Was the swelling present before? And he says to me, no, this swelling was never ever present before. It's completely new. 
only in the last, uh, I noticed it now, but anyway, I'm very sure that it has happened only after the fever. Okay. When he came to the hospital at the time when we examined, we did not find such a swelling. So during the course of hospital stay, obviously he's having a pyrexia of unknown origin. So he's admitted for a few days in the hospital. So now he has developed this swelling. What should I do with this swelling? There is a swelling. It, it's, it's slightly soft in consistency. It's not bony consistency. It's slightly soft in consistency. Now tell me what should I do next? You tell me. What should I do next? What should I do next? Okay, so I'm just waiting for your answers. So um, see, it's a swelling. It's a new swelling. And I want to find out what the hell is inside that swelling. So what should I do? What should I do? I should go for an FNAC of the swelling. It's not a bony swelling, right? And uh, we did an FNAC. And this is the low power view. You're seeing a finding. And I've given an arrow. So the arrow is something that I've marked. There is a finding there. Can somebody tell me what is the finding there? What is the finding there? What is the finding there? There is a finding there. The arrow, there is a red arrow showing a finding. This is the low power view and I'll show you the high power view as well. This is the high power view. Now what is this? Anand, I appreciate your answer. FNAC, Nithya, very good. Aspiration of the swelling, fantastic. Sarah Abraham, wonderful. FNAC, uh, Aishu, you have also said FNAC, very good. So what is this? What is this? Just think, think what is this? Hudson says mod cell. Mod cell you get in the base of fill. Now, there is an abnormality here, and you're seeing multiple structures inside a cell. Okay, inside a cell. So, um, so inside a large cell, there are certain dot, 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 dot structures. Are you seeing this? So, inside this, are you seeing some small dot, 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 dot structures? Yes. Here also. What are these structures? What are they? What are they? So somebody sees Russell body, Philip. Uh, okay. Now, see, um, anyone? Inclusion body. See, uh, now just revisit the history once again. Prolonged fever. Prolonged fever. Significant weight loss. Okay. And uh, just see something. You know, I just showed you a physical finding, right? What do you think is this physical finding? What do you think is this physical finding? I showed you this patient's hand. Now, uh, look at his palm and look at his forearm. What is striking? Now, you can see that the forearm is very much dark. You can see that there is a significant hyperpigmentation of his forearm. There is a significant hyperpigmentation of his forearm. Okay, there is significant hyperpigmentation of his forearm. In fact, over his face also it was there. But since I don't want to, you know, reveal the patient identity, I'm just not uh, showing you the picture of the face. But you can see there is a definite disproportionate hyperpigmentation. Okay, so just look at his palms and look at his forearms. But something I did not just uh, tell you in the history is I did not want to make it too obvious because the patient himself, you know, had this pigmentation. So he is having significant hyperpigmentation. So prolonged fever, black hyperpigmentation. What is it? Yeah, fantastic. Trinath Mishra. Trinath Mishra. Trinath Mishra. Atira Prasad. Atira Prasad, uh, fantastic. 
uh, very good. Adira Prasad and um, Trinath Mishra. Trinath Mishra, where are you from? So, see, you should consider, you should consider, see, common diseases are common, no doubt about it. But in such a scenario, you should think of certain uncommon diseases as well. Now, this, in fact, is what you call the LD bodies. What are LD bodies? LD bodies are Leishman Donovan bodies. Leishman Donovan bodies or the LD bodies. Okay. Leishman Donovan bodies. And you see that all these bodies. Now you tell me, let me see who is good in microbiology here. So all those dot, dot, dot structures that you are seeing here that are appreciated in a hyper view. You tell me what are these bodies? What are LD bodies? What are LD bodies? Tell me. What are LD bodies? What are they? No, as um, many students, Hiba, they are saying it is Namita. They are saying it is Kalasa. But tell me what are these LD bodies? What exactly are they? What structures? They are the, they are what? A mastigots. A mastigot. Do not worry. I'll just brief you on what a mastigot and pro mastigot is. If you are hearing this word and you're thinking, what was this a mastigot? Do not worry. In a short span, I'll just tell you what it's an a mastigot. But these are a mastigots, and that actually helped us come to a diagnosis of um, leishmaniasis. Leishmaniasis. They are LD bodies. They are a mastigots. Okay. Now. I'll tell you what exactly they are. Meanwhile, I told you we were awaiting the trifine biopsy. See, I told you trifine biopsy is a more detailed study. Then, you know, we got the trifine biopsy. And look at these yellow arrows. Can you see the A mastigotes or the LD bodies, those dot dot structures? Those dot dot structures, can you see these A mastigots in that yellow arrow? Yes. So the bone marrow biopsy showed LD bodies. That also showed LD bodies because at that by that time we got the report of the trifine biopsy as well. Now we are very sure the nodule in his fingers had LD bodies. The bone marrow trifine biopsy also had LD bodies. Also had LD bodies. Okay. So this was the bone marrow trifine biopsy result. The erythroid normoblastic maturation, myeloid maturation normal, megakaryocytes were seen. Also seen are histiocytes with LD bodies suggestive of leishmaniasis. Suggestive of what? Leishmaniasis. Right? Fine. Fine. Now, uh, I'll just tell you for some of my students who probably would have forgotten some of the basic points on Leishmaniasis. Let me just get you also into the picture. So I'll just go through some quick highlights of Leishmaniasis. Am I going to teach you Leishmaniasis in detail? No, but just what is required for your exam. What you should know, that is what I'm going to teach you in just five minutes Okay, of Leishmaniasis. And after that, we'll come back to this case and discuss it. Now, under the highlights, what are the important previous year questions that have been asked? Number one, what is the causative organism? Number two, what is the vector? Number three, what is the mode of transmission? Number four, the morphological forms. Number five, clinical syndromes. Number six, laboratory diagnosis. And number seven, drugs used for treatment. So causative organism, it is the organism which is, uh, which is belonging to the genus Leishmania. And what is Leishmania? If you are asked the microbiology of Leishmania in one sentence, it is a unicellular eukaryotic obligatory intracellular protozoa. So protozoa are always unicellular, right? And what do you call these multicellular in parasitology? If you have got unicell protozoans are unicellular. So what are multicellular organisms? What do you call them? Multicellular metazoans, right? Metazoans. So metazoans, what are they? You have got the cestodes, nematodes, you know, the tapeworms, okay, cestodes, nematodes, okay, trematodes, okay, all them are metazoans, okay, so that is what is the organism. Remember the genus Leishmania has almost 20 species, okay, 20 species. I'm sure my dear students, you've heard of this Leishmania donovani, 
it is a species okay so the genus leishmania has many species one of which is leishmania donovan right so that is a causative organism what about the vector the vector is the sand fly very important previous question vector is the sand fly now sand fly what is it called it is called you know uh, see there are different types of sand fly in asia africa and europe the sand fly that causes the leishmaniasis is phlebotomus okay whereas in the american countries okay it is lutsomyia that is the name of the sand fly so both phlebotomus and lutsomyia are name of sand flies okay now the one in asia africa and europe you know you call it the old world leishmaniasis old world leishmaniasis and uh, this one you call as new world leishmaniasis new world leishmaniasis okay Le new world leishmaniasis fantastic right okay now mode of transmission well the mode of transmission of this disease depends on which species of leishmaniasis is involved so if you've got leishmania donovani it has got an anthroponotic mode of transmission which means it is transmitted from infected humans to healthy humans with the help of a vector that is called anthroponotic transmission whereas leishmania infantum has a zoonotic mode of transmission means it is from the animal reservoir okay which are dogs uh, rodents so from there to the humans that is the zoonotic mode of transmission next what are the morphological forms of this organism which organism leishmania remember it has got two forms one is a promastigote which has a flagella that protrudes outside the cell and that an a mastigote a there is no flagella outside the cell there is no flagella protruding out so the form of the organism that occurs inside the vector who is the vector sand fly is the promastigote and in the host who is the host human is the host so humans will have the amastigote so basically what happens is the promastigotes which are you know located in the proboscis okay in the proboscis region of the female sand fly so when they bite uh, or you know they they they, they bite a, a, a human this promastigote goes to the human so first it is taken up by the neutrophil and subsequently from the neutrophil which undergoes apoptosis subsequently these organisms are again released which is taken up by the macrophages so i want to make it a point here it's an important mcq remember the reticulo endothelial system is the preferred site for this uh, leishmania so the host reticulo endothelial system that is the hub of leishmania what is reticulo endothelial system it's basically the name that you call for a heterogeneous population of phagocytic cells which include the monocytes the macrophages etc okay so they will go to the macrophages and inside the macrophages you will have proliferation of the organism into what into the uh, a mastigote so inside the macrophages what do you see a mastigote in the vector what do you see that is a sand fly what do you see the promastigote so you can remember like this the sand fly gives promastigote to the host but you know suppose if if it transmits infection between humans it will take up the uh, the uh, amastigote okay when it takes a blood meal it takes up it's a hemoflagellate the 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 organism so it takes up the uh, the 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 sand fly will take up the amastigote and then inside the sand fly this amastigote will be converted to what promastigote okay important and once the promastigote is formed inside the sand fly it will come to p for what proboscis promastigote comes to the proboscis waiting to go for the next host okay important now coming to the clinical syndromes of leishmaniasis leishmaniasis can have three clinical syndromes one is a visceral leishmaniasis which is the severe form of the disease in which the patients will present with prolonged fever often with pyrexia of unknown origin with uh, splenomegaly which is massive and a mild to moderate hepatomegaly okay there is significant weight loss as well very important and 
visceral leishmaniasis the patient will get a dark discoloration of the skin which is why it is also referred to as kala azar kala azar kala means what black in hindi so it is kala azar okay right so that is a severe form cutaneous leishmaniasis is the next form whereas whereas visceral leishmaniasis is a more severe disease uh, well uh, cutaneous leishmaniasis they commonly present either with certain macules or with certain nodules or with certain ulceration okay and finally you have got the mucosal leishmaniasis which has a predilection for mucosal involvement okay now another peculiarity of visceral leishmaniasis is even patients with visceral leishmaniasis may may actually have some cutaneous involvement which commonly but not always happens after the infection so if a skin involvement happens after the infection what do you call it pkdl what is pkdl post kala asar dermal leishmaniasis post kala asar dermal leishmaniasis post kala asar dermal leishmaniasis pkdl i said mostly it happens after the interval because once the kala asar is gone after a few months maybe even 6 months 1 year then you get the dermal involvement so that is called a post kala asar dermal leishmaniasis but sometimes a uh, post kala asar dermal leishmaniasis though you, though you call it post kala asar sometimes it can happen along with the kala asar along with kala asar you may get some nodules that is what you call as a post kala asar dermal leishmaniasis then you get a mucosal leishmaniasis just i'll show you three pictures these are not my patients this is actually taken from harrison the actual case is my case but this one this picture which i am showing you is taken from harrison see the first image this is that of a visceral leishmaniasis where the patient presents with a prolonged fever and uh, you can see the abdomen is exposed and what they have marked in the picture is a massive splenomegaly and you can see in the face there are certain nodules in the second picture this is a cutaneous leishmaniasis third you can see extensive mucosal involvement this is a mucosal leishmaniasis so you see how diverse the spectrum of manifestation is now what do you think this is the most common one mcq what is the most common type of leishmaniasis cutaneous leishmaniasis cutaneous leishmaniasis is the most common one right fine now how do you come to a diagnosis now when you think about diagnosis of um, you know the uh, leishmaniasis remember uh, you've got to demonstrate in the tissue which means uh, if you take a aspirate from the spleen uh, you can demonstrate it from the bone marrow or from the lymph node is lymphadenopathy very common not very common but still can occur okay now out of this uh, which is more sensitive mcq out of all the tissue diagnosis which specimen has the highest sensitivity to yield the diagnosis answer is splenic aspirate highest sensitivity it's given in harrison 95 percentage exact value from harrison 95 percentage but bone marrow the yield is 60 to 85 percentage but you tell me why did we not go for a splenic aspirate why did we not go for a splenic aspirate because there is always it's a risky procedure splenic aspirate is always risky which is why you will go for a bone marrow in spite of slightly lower sensitivity and the slight sensitivity is even lower for a lymph node okay now next question is an ini ct question a previous neat pg question now previously we relied only on tissue diagnosis but now at the community level especially you know in countries where leishmaniasis is very abundant do you know the countries where you commonly see leishmaniasis one is india yes you can have bangladesh okay bangladesh sudan okay these are countries where you get good number of leishmaniasis cases and uh, see this patient was our patient from kerala so kerala leishmaniasis is slightly rare but you know it's not rare in a state like bihar bihar leishmaniasis is common okay so that also you have got to keep in mind you know if the same patient came to a uh, uh, phenician bihar it is slightly more easy because it's such a common disease there okay now there is one rapid immunochromatographic test which is used in the laboratory diagnosis of uh, leishmaniasis which is a question asked for inict what is the name of the test 
RK39 rapid diagnostic test. Very, very important. It's given in Harrison as well. So what is this diagnostic test? It is a test that detects antibodies against an antigen. What antigen? The name of the antigen is RK39. Okay. So that is a rapid immunochromatographic test. Okay. So these are the laboratory diagnoses. Okay. So that is also clear. What is the last part? What are the drugs available? What are the drugs available for the management of leishmaniasis? So the drugs available for pharmacological point of view, the last part of the discussion, we are almost coming to a close. You know, you've got the pentavalent antimonial compounds, which are two drugs. One is sodium stibogluconate and the second one is meglumin. So sodium stibogluconate and also meglumin are the pentavalent antimonial compounds, which are very effective, except there is one state in India which is notorious for resistance to this a compound just because it was so commonly used. What should be that state where, you know, it is most commonly seen Bihar. So as per the guidelines as well, you know, in Bihar, you are not supposed to use the pentavalent antimonials. Bihar, you know, you have to straight away go for amphotericin B. Here also we use amphotericin B. And amphotericin B, you have got the different formulations. Okay. So even you have got the uh, liposomal amphotericin B as well. The liposomal formulation is having more advantages over the, uh, the conventional amphotericin B deoxycholate formulation. And the next one is paromomycin, which is an aminoglycoside antibiotic and also miltifosin. Okay. And there is an MCQ in miltifosin, which is the first oral drug which is uh, given or approved for the treatment of leishmaniasis. The first oral drug for leishmaniasis is miltifosin. Okay. So these are the compounds that are used. Now, many a times the problem with these, uh, with the leishmaniasis treatment is it will often require prolonged treatment. Do you know something? This very patient of ours, we treated him with amphotericin B. So the amphotericin B, you know, we give him infusion. Okay. Amphotericin B is given as an IV infusion. So this is given every alternate days for 30 days. So once again, I'm telling you, in case of visceral leishmaniasis, there is a slight difference with the cutaneous and mucosal. But I'm just telling you, this is just for your knowledge. They are not going to ask you anything regarding the diagnosis. But as a clinician, you should know that amphotericin B, the problem is it has, in case of visceral leishmaniasis, this is given like every alternate day, 15 infusions for 30 days, which means today you give amphotericin B infusion, tomorrow you will not. So for 30 days, you give like that. So 15 infusions are given. Now you tell me MCQ, which is the electrolyte abnormality you have to monitor while the patient is on amphotericin. Very important. Very important. What is the electrolyte abnormality? Very important. Previous question, pharmacology question, hypokalemia. You've got to know this. Hypokalemia. Invariably, you will develop hypokalemia. Any patient on amphotericin B, invariably, invariably there will be hypokalemia, which means get ready to supplement potassium when you give amphotericin B. The next day itself, you check the potassium, you know, it will be slightly on the lower side. You start a treatment with, uh, you know, the uh, potassium supplements. And there is something else with amphotericin B, which is again interesting. When you give amphotericin B to a patient, the patient will have fever with chills and rigor. Okay. Patient will have fever with chills and rigor. As a adverse effect of the drug. So I'll just tell you about this patient. Day one, we gave him amphotericin D. That day he was very febrile. He had chills and rigor. Second day, he was better. No chills and rigor. Third day, when you give amphotericin B again, chills and rigor. But gradually what happens once the effect of the drug takes place, fever will come down. Patient will feel better. You check the splenomegaly, it will slowly subside. We could see that in front of our eyes. See, that is the, you know, when you have such a case, you can see there is a regression of splenomegaly slowly. You know, each day that you see the patient, you can see every two or three days, obviously you can see there is a spleen actually going inwards. Okay. So that is important. And uh, that is what, you know, like I told you, right, you know, the patient develops fever with chills when you give amphotericin B. So much so that we say that if you give amphotericin B and the patient has no chills, give amphotericin B, no chills, this is not amphotericin. This is something else. 
because if it is a good quality amphotericin B, it will have chills and dry up. Okay, that is something you should be watchful about. So that is it about this case. You know, the summary here is, see, always you have got to go in a systematic manner. Now, um, see, uh, at this point of time, it, it's because, you know, this was just an interactive session. I did not uh, discuss the differentials after the history and examination. Otherwise, you know, I would have brought this uh, differential of, uh, uh, you know, Leishmaniasis also. Uh, but I, I just wanted to keep the suspense. But just tell me something. What is the closest differential diagnosis of Leishmaniasis? Exact line in Harrison. What is the closest differential diagnosis of Leishmaniasis? What is the closest differential diagnosis? So many investigations, but what are the closest differential diagnosis of Leishmaniasis? Malaria. Yes, malaria. Malaria is a very close differential diagnosis. And also, you know, tuberculosis, typhoid. Uh, these are all, you know, mimics of um, uh, the Leishmaniasis. But the point is very simple. Why did I actually present this case before you today? Is because just to tell you, uh, you know, when it, when it comes to uh, scenarios in your actual practice, uh, it's sometimes fascinating to see cases um, being worked up. Uh, so always remember when you learn something in medicine, always, even at an MBBS level, you think like a clinician. Okay, that thought process should be there. See, with the next exams coming, with the exams turning into clinical scenarios, gone are the days where, you know, you would just focus on factual knowledge alone. You have got to focus on clinical scenarios and you have got to solve clinical scenario questions as well, which is very, very important. Okay, so uh, I hope you enjoyed today's session. And um, yeah, any doubts, let me know about uh, the case. Any doubts that you have? Pranath, uh, about CML. CML definitely can present with fever and uh, hepatosplenomegaly, absolutely right. That can also have a very close differential. I agree, lymphemias and lymphomas. Though I said malaria as an infection, leukemias and lymphomas can very well present with, uh, you know, prolonged fever and hepatosplenomegaly. It's a very important differential diagnosis. And I feel, you know, it is a top differential diagnosis than Kalasa. Unless, you know, you are in a state like Bihar. But otherwise, uh, you know, many of my dear students were stressing on leukemias and lymphomas. I totally agree with you. You were spot on. That is the first thing that you've got to think about. So you can scan this QR code for join, for following me on Instagram. And um, this is the QR code for following me on the Telegram channel. Okay. Right. So uh, just let me know if you have any doubts regarding this particular case. I'm just waiting for a few more minutes just to see your doubts, your queries on this case. Right. So just let me know. Going to the case, um, the hyperpigmentation was very obvious. You know, you ask him a uh, uh, dark, uh, you know, I ask, you ask, he himself told that, you know, he had a very dark face now. I still remember I was conversing with the mother of the patient. Uh, so she said, my son has gone dark. So I asked, he is, is he dark otherwise? She said, she, he is slightly dark, but now he has become very much dark. Kalasa. Okay. Now, there is one important point, you know, I just want to stress here is about something very unique about this case. Now, remember, when I talked to you about post Kalasa Dermal Leishmaniasis, I told you PKDL, especially in the Indian subcontinent. Okay. So, Philip Christie is also asking about the demographic differences. So, it is absolutely right because, see, normally in the Indian subcontinent, when you develop a post Kalasa Dermal Leishmaniasis, there is a minimum gap of six months you know there is a table in harrison also showing the uh, you know the geographic distribution geographic differences between the types of leishmaniasis which has got to do with the properties of the you know the uh, organism uh, which are in different parts of the world so there are different you know phlebotomus itself has different species so has to go do with that so usually there is a gap of six months but something unique about our case was the PKDL in this case occurred almost simultaneously along with the Leishmaniasis. Okay. Almost simultaneously along with the Leishmaniasis. That is the dermal Leishmaniasis. That is why you develop the nodule. 
normally the common cases of pkdl that we get in india there is a gap so you have a patient with leishmaniasis you treat him you he goes away and after a few months he then comes with some nodules like this okay it's a post calardus or dermal leishmaniasis okay right any other doubts a very heterogeneous disease okay if you do not treat the patient can go on to have uh, complications okay very important that's why you said visceral leishmaniasis is the danger person okay he is you know it is a fatal disease okay this is a fatal disease okay right so that's it so just let me know um, did you uh, enjoy the case uh, i just wanted to put a case at your level so that you are also able to participate and learn from this and uh, once you see a case and then you go and read about it you are likely to remember it that's what i commonly do in my lectures as well i try to bring in my own case scenarios so that um, it stays longer okay but if you just read some textbook alone sometimes you might understand but later you are likely to forget okay Navya, uh, I am there in Telegram. You can even text me in uh, Instagram as well. Navya Reddy, Instagram also if you have any queries. Okay. Right. So that's it. Thank you everyone for joining and uh, it was a pleasure interacting with all of you. Thank you so much. So, uh, yeah. Thank you everyone. Okay. Thank you everyone for joining. Bye bye. Yeah, so we'll try to have more such discussions, more such case scenario discussions, okay, based on actual cases so that uh, you're able to remember better. Okay. Right. Thank you so much.